Welcome back to the podcast. It's the podcast, the Empire Builders podcast. I'm Dave Young. I'm sitting here with Stephen Semple. Virtually, as we do, you whispered the name of the, the subject of this podcast into my ear, and I'm, I'm trying even to remember it from 30 seconds ago. Martha Matilda, Matilda Harper. Harper. Martha yes. Matilda Harper. A yes. household name if I've ever heard one. I have nothing for this. And she should be a household name. There should be business schools with her name on it, and she should mm. be a woman that we are studying in business school. When I came across this story, I was shocked that I'd never heard of this woman, especially since she was born in Canada on top of all mm. of that. And it is one of these ones that I'm really happy and proud to share because her story needs to be told. Her story mm -hmm. really needs to be told. As you learn about her, I think you'll be as blown away as I was, because we often think of Ray Kroc from McDonald's is often referred to as the father of franchising. Mm -hmm. But when you think about it, he was not the first franchiser. Singer did the first franchise and certainly the first franchise agreement. But Martha started around the same time as Singer and some believe predated Singer. Like some of these dates are hard Hard to nail down. So this is, you're talking about Singer Sewing Machines. Singer Sewing Machines, I yes. didn't know that that was even a franchise. Yeah, it was when it first started off. So you'd be the Singer store in town. Yeah, so we'll probably do one on, on Singer at a certain point here. But okay. 60 years before Ray Kroc came along, Martha built a chain of 500 hair salons all over the world using a franchise model. Oh, wow. Right? 500. 500. 500. Okay. And this is actually the model that hair salons are using today. Oh my God. What was the name of it? Have we heard of it? You've never heard of it. And you're just going to have to wait for the name. Okay. You've never heard of All any right. of this. It's a travesty. I keep telling you, it's crazy. So Martha Harper was born September 10th, 1857 in Oakville, Ontario, Canada. And she was the fourth of 10 children, all of whom shared a one room log cabin. So they were very, very poor. Her Man, father was yeah. a tailor who, in her words, was a stern, unflinching English pioneer too occupied with his daily struggle to pay much heed to her. So you kind of got the flavor of what... Her and her nine siblings. <laughs> her and her nine siblings. <laughs> and he eventually pivoted his business to renting out his children as labor. At age seven, Martha was sent off to be a house servant for a wealthy farmer. She was paid $4 a month, which all went to her dad. Five years later, she was transferred to a home of a nearby doctor whose wife died. Now, the doctor is believed to be Dr. Weston Leroy Herman. And what's important about this is that Herman had a special interest in the physiology of hair. Hmm. In the late 1800s, there was not much interest in hair care. Hair was not washed. The soaps were crude at the time. They were made of hog fat and ashes, and they were in short supply. So Herman studied things like scalp hygiene and the effects of hair brushing. And he shared these interests with Martha, who was eager to learn. So you could kind of picture him doing this stuff and at the end of the day, kind of sharing that with her. You could kind of imagine that, right? When he died in 1879, he left Martha a small amount of money and a recipe for a hair tonic made from herbs. So okay. she's now 25 years old and she decides to move to Rochester, New York for a fresh start. And we forget that at this time, Rochester was a booming place. Rochester, New York, at this time, was a real booming place and very, very progressive. It was a hotbed for the suffragette movement. So mm. while Susan B. Anthony was born in Adam, Massachusetts, she's buried in Mount Hope Cemetery in Rochester. Okay. So that speaks to the importance of Rochester. Martha moves to Rochester, and she finds work as a servant with a lawyer, and then later a wealthy woman, Luella J. Roberts. And at this time, hair care is done in the home, and Martha becomes Mrs. Roberts' personal beautician. And she's so skilled, soon there's you know, other members of high society coming by the house to visit to get treatments. Martha starts to make her own hair tonic and experiment a little bit with the recipe. And she even starts a small test. She makes some bottles, and she starts handing them out door to door. Sampling, okay. right? Yeah. Wrigley's, yeah. right? And she senses a business opportunity. So it's 1888. She's 31 years old, and she invests her life savings of $360 into Harper Hairdressing Parlor. 
the one you've never heard of. I'm just thinking at $4 a month that mostly went to her dad, how long it took her to save up 300 bucks. Yeah, a long while. So she wanted to open in the Powers Building, which is a nine-star building. It had the finest businesses in town, right? So it's that whole halo effect, right? Mm -hmm. Which we've talked about before. And she wanted to design this hairdressing parlor with a luxury feel and healthy and purity and all those things. And she even created the Harper method. Customers were treated to the Harper method. She named it. She made mm. a thing and she created a brand. She named it. It's a two hour treatment where there was a facial, head and shoulder massage, and she had all sorts of names for all the things that she did. She started to market and she used her own hair to market the services. So she had this long chestnut colored mane. It was so long mm -hmm. that P.T. Barnum tried to hire her. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's the rest of the story. So like a lot of businesses that are a brand new idea, at first the business was slow. Sounds familiar, right? Yeah. Because her high-end clientele still wanted to do home visits. There was this opposition to this idea of going to a public salon. There's real resistance to that. But here's where the breakthrough happened for her. Music teacher opened next door to her, and this music teacher had no waiting room. So Martha offered her salon. She said, you can use my salon as a waiting room. Mm -hmm. So guess what started to happen? Women would get hair treatments while waiting for their kids to finish their piano lessons. Perfect. Right? And this was at a time where customer service was still kind of a bit of a foreign concept and Martha continually worked to make the experience better. She invented, here's the thing she invented, the first reclining shampoo chair. Nice. You know that special sink with the cutout yeah. for the neck? She invented that, right? She invented a whole pile of things and shortly word of this exotic new salon concept started to spread amongst the elite in Rochester and the salon was a three chair shop and was soon being visited by people from other cities. Like word got out there. Martha would start getting requests to open shops in other cities and she refused nice. until a certain number of women signed a petition to open. Cause she wanted to make sure there was a market there first. Sure, yeah. Right, brilliant, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, yeah. Here's the other thing she decided to do. And it's interesting, Ray Kroc should have learned from her cause it took a long time for Ray Kroc to learn this. If you remember, Ray Kroc his first franchisees were rich people, and it didn't work. It wasn't until Ray Kroc started figuring out to speak to blue-collar, hard-working folks that it worked. She yeah. decided right out of the gate she was going to hire women like her, lower-class servants and maids. People that know how to work hard that just need a plan. Right. People who had the drive but lacked the money. Stay tuned, we're gonna wrap up this story and tell you how to apply this lesson to your business right after this. Hey Rick, how's it going? Okay, fine. <laughs> that doesn't sound okay. Well, what is it? My business. What about it? You probably wouldn't understand. Hit me. Well, you know I love it. But? My revenues have flatlined and I'm not growing anymore. Okay. Well, it's frustrating and depressing and it was so much better when we were growing. Oh, I bet it was. And nothing I've tried has moved the needle. What about talking to Steven? Steven who? You know, the guy that hosts this podcast. Really? You think he could help? I hear he runs a paid for performance marketing agency. I wonder how that works. Why don't you ask him? How? Book one of those free starter sessions on the podcast website. I don't know. You can't say you've tried everything. If you don't try this. You're right. I might even learn something. I bet you do. Thanks, man. Let's go grab a bite. Yeah, sounds good. Right after you call Steven. Okay, okay. Book your starter session on this podcast website. Just visit theempirebuilderspodcast.com and click on Get Started. Let's pick up our story where we left off, and trust me, you haven't missed a thing. It would have been easy to do this with the leap, but it's not always the best thing. Again, Ray Kroc learned this experience yeah. by the hard way. Had he gone to a business school with her name on it, he would have learned from her. But they didn't have money. These people didn't have money. So what she did is they would pay a fee that was done as a loan. And they would agree to buy the brushes, tonics, chairs, all the stuff they needed from the salon from her. She mm -hmm. chose each location, controlled signage and advertising. Does any of this sound familiar, Dave? Kind of <laughs> sounds like a franchise, doesn't it? Absolutely it does, yeah. Right? So in 1891, she opens the first location, and it's in Buffalo, and it's really like one of the first 
real franchise models, where it's the whole idea, I select the location, control the signage, control the advertising, you pay an upfront fee, and you buy products from me. Yeah. The only thing is she did is the fee is a loan. And all named the same? All named exactly the same. And it's so successful that 13 years later, in 1914, she has 134 franchises in 128 cities, including some in Europe. Man, that's amazing. Martha Harper becomes the first female member of the Rochester Chamber of Commerce. 1920 to 1921, she went from 175 shops to 350. She became so successful that her clients included Susan B. Anthony, Woodrow Wilson, Joe Kennedy, Rose Kennedy, George Bernard Shaw, Lady Bird Johnson. These are the people who were her customers. When she passed in 1950, at the age of 93, it had grown to 500 shops, and her estate was estimated to be worth about $11 million. That's terrific. Isn't that terrific? That really is. It's a beautiful story. How did the business schools miss this? I have no idea because, you know, here's the thing. Normally our lessons in this is people see this idea in another business or another place and mm -hmm. apply that knowledge in a unique way. What's so brilliant about Martha Harper is she didn't do that. She learned all of this on her own. Yeah. Figured it out on her own. Saw these challenges of, okay, well, I want to expand it, but I want to do it this way. How do I do this? Like, she innovated like crazy long before guys like Ray Kroc came along. Like, what a trailblazer. And yes, how do we not know about this woman's story? When you mentioned all the famous people that were her customers and customers of her stores, there's no doubt that she planted the seeds of innovation for all kinds of franchises, right? There's just no doubt in my mind that her systems set a standard for how to do this kind of thing. It's like so many innovations that were sparked by women, men just came in and took credit for it. This happens in science all the time. There needs to be a business school in her name. And you know, in fact, you know what we should do, Dave? After we publish this podcast, we should reach out to our tribe at the Wizards Academy, and we should raise money for a plaque at the Wizard Academy in her name. That would be fantastic. We need to do that because this woman deserves recognition. Her story needs to be told and not lost because, first of all, at the time she grew up with the very few rights that women had and grew up dirt, dirt, dirt poor. My admiration for her is is just, yeah, her story needs to be. Yeah. And, and when I researched it, I was like, we are telling this story to the world. You know, what I think is a, is a lasting thing, you know, more than a hundred years later, you still hear people talking about going to the beauty parlor. So the yes. word parlor associated with this, that had to have come from her. I had not even thought of that. Yes. It became a part of, of the language. It may actually be named a spa, right? But people talk about going to the beauty parlor. And spa is really a more modern iteration. Great observation. So yeah, as I mentioned earlier, there really should be a business school somewhere with her name on it. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Amazing. Thanks for sharing the story of Martha. Martha Matilda Harper. I mean, it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but it's worth remembering. Martha Matilda Harper. That's right. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, David. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Please share us. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app and leave us a big, fat, juicy five-star rating and review. And if you have any questions about this or any other podcast episode, email to questions at the Empire Builders Podcast. Dot com.